Something very strange has happened off the coast of this tiny island isolated in the Pacific Ocean. The island itself, which is home to a population of just 2,000 people, is also home to a lot of tiger sharks. One of the highest concentrations of tiger sharks in the world can be found just off the coast of this craggy rock. But it's not just about how many of them there are here, but it's also about how big they are. On the whole, this particular shark species tends to average around nine or 10 feet long, about three meters. But mysteriously, many of the tiger sharks that live off Norfolk Island are some of the largest recorded tiger sharks in the world, dwarfing their counterparts elsewhere and regularly reaching sizes of nearly 15 feet long four and a half meters. As to exactly how and why they've managed to just get so big here remains up for debate, but many people have pointed to human interference once again playing a role, although all might not be as it first seems. Nonetheless, with local residents becoming increasingly concerned for the safety of swimmers, now more than ever, scientists are trying to solve this supersized shark mystery. So join me today as we delve into this truly fascinating story. Together, we'll find out just what is making these sharks so big and we'll find out exactly whether the residents of Norfolk accidentally created these massive sharks. Welcome back to another Shark Bites episode, everyone. Now, scientists first started to raise their eyebrows at Norfolk Island about five years ago, back in 2020. After getting a tip off from local residents about some pretty large tiger sharks, a team of shark scientists from some of Australia's top universities decided to head out 900 miles into the Pacific for a pilot mission. The team included shark researchers, Dr. Charlie Hooveniers and Dr. Lauren Mayer, two shark scientists well known for their research in Australia. Initially, it was an area of research a bit closer to my experience in that they were looking to see whether the sharks there had been impacted by microplastics, despite it being such a remote area. But when they got there, they couldn't believe what they were seeing, and the research scope turned into something much bigger than just a microplastic study. Somehow, they'd inadvertently stumbled upon one of the largest tiger shark aggregation sites in the world. As they began fishing for the sharks to assess the population, they were catching and releasing some huge individuals, mostly females between two and four and a half meters long. Looking at this graph here, you can see the size spread of the sharks that were caught and measured, and almost all of them are in this 3.75 to 4.25 meter bracket. If graphs aren't really your thing for visualizing, then take a look at this quick clip here of one of the sharks that they were tagging. If we pause it and just take a second to look at this, that's Charlie Hooveniers right there, and just look at the size of that shark. Okay, there's a bit of forced perspective, sure, but that is an absolute beauty of a tiger shark, easily four meters plus. Now, as well as these sharks being unusually large, they were also catching loads of them. In just a single day, they were hooking, tagging, and releasing over 20 of these enormous sharks, which if you ask anyone who's done shark tagging before, is a very good day of shark tagging. Back in 2020, the team tagged so many sharks that they knew they were gonna have to come back. And they did so for the subsequent three years, collecting blood and tissue samples and satellite tagging the sharks. Over three expeditions, they managed to capture 87 sharks and only two of them were individuals that they'd captured before. That's a decent population of tiger sharks. Okay, admittedly, it's not the biggest one in the world. That accolade goes to Fuva Mula in the Maldives, but still, it's a very healthy population. And to support such a population of large sharks, something very special has to be going on. And so it begs the question, why are tiger sharks hanging around this otherwise unassuming island hundreds of miles from anywhere else in the Pacific Ocean? Well, Norfolk Island sits on something called the Norfolk Ridge. This ridge is littered with seamounts from New Zealand all the way to New Caledonia, stretching hundreds of miles long. And these seamounts are hotspots for biodiversity, bringing in a whole suite of animal communities from the smallest invertebrates to the largest of fish, including sharks. Sharks depend on seamounts for food, navigation, and mating. And so because Norfolk Island sits along this chain of seamounts, Mounds, you're likely going to get a higher density of sharks there. As well as this, the oceanography of the area is highly influenced by the East Australian Current. I need to get to the East Australian Current. Oh, dude, you're riding it, dude! Yep, that one from Finding Nemo. The EAC helps bring warm waters from the Coral Sea south and allows both temperate and tropical species to thrive here. The island basically sits slap bang in the middle of an area where marine biodiversity is just so high. But that's not the only reason Norfolk Island is home to these types sharks, and seamounts and currents don't really explain why they get so big here. That particular factor has a different explanation, one that requires us to dive into the history of the island itself. Norfolk Island is steeped in colonial history and was once upon a time a penal settlement where criminals were sent to perform hard labor as a form of secondary punishment. It was reputed to be one of the harshest in all the British Empire, so much so that prisoners were said to have preferred the death penalty than be sent to what they called hell in the Pacific. After the penal settlement closed in the mid 
1800s, though, it would later go on to be the new home for the people of Pitcairn Island, who chose to relocate to Norfolk for a better life. And for the next 150 years, the island would be an agricultural farming settlement, where its inhabitants lived off the land and tended to cattle. And as part of that farming culture, the cattle would, from time to time, be killed for their meat to feed the islanders. Now, because Norfolk is a very small and very remote island, the inhabitants have heavily relied on the groundwater there to survive. Because this groundwater was so important, it meant they weren't able to stick to traditional methods of dealing with their food waste, i.e. landfill sites. You can see how it might be a bit risky putting all your cow carcasses and food waste into a landfill site where pathogens and other harmful organisms might seep into and contaminate your groundwater. And then exporting all your waste back to the mainland would be expensive and a logistical nightmare. So instead of using a landfill site, they went for a slightly more unique method right here at Headstone Point. Using this little waste chute here, the farmers would fling all their butcher's waste, dead cows and offal out into Headstone Bay. I know, you can see where this is going. So for over a hundred years, cow carcasses, blood and guts were getting chucked into the sea and left for the ocean's inhabitants to deal with. And if there's one type of ocean inhabitant that won't pass up on a free meal, it's the tiger shark. These scavenger sharks will eat just about anything you put in front of them, and a cow carcass for them is pretty much a delicacy. So over the space of those hundred years, tiger sharks would come to this all-you-can-eat cow buffet to fill up on food and swim off. And you can bet over that time, they began to learn almost exactly when and where this free food would appear. Sharks are incredibly switched on animals, and if you regularly present them with food, you can easily alter their behavior. We saw that happening with the lionfish video we did a few weeks back, and this is just the same. But there's a bigger issue that's only reared its head in the last few years, and it's got some of the island's locals a bit on edge. The dumping of food waste into the ocean on Norfolk Island over the last couple of years has started to be phased out due to environmental law changes in Australia, which prohibit this practice in marine park waters. According to reports, waste dumping off Headstone Point has decreased significantly in the last couple of years, but some offal and waste from butchers continues to be disposed of in the water. It's thought that many of the island's inhabitants are a bit concerned as to what might happen if a food source that has been utilized by sharks for over a hundred years just suddenly vanished. And you can't really blame them for thinking that. As far as records go back, there hasn't been a single documented unprovoked shark attack on the island, save for an incident where a fisherman lacerated his arm on a shark in 1892. Now, just because there haven't been any documented cases doesn't mean there haven't been any cases at all. I imagine there probably were some incidents back when prisoners tried to escape that convict settlement in the 1800s. Still though, you can't ignore that data, and with such a numerous population of a large shark species known for attacking and on occasion consuming humans, it's interesting. Could the reason for there being no shark attacks be attributed to the dumped cow carcasses and it's just kept them at bay? And could that be the reason why they're just so much bigger here when compared to other places? Well, in reality, it's a little more multi-layered than that. As part of the scientific research on the island, Charlie Huveneers and Lauren Mayer wanted to try and figure out some of those questions. And the first step was to see if the shark behavior had really been altered by the dumping of cows at Headstone Point. To figure this out, when they were catching and tagging the sharks, they inserted tiny acoustic transmitters into their bodies. Alongside this, they placed acoustic receiver stations at various different points around the island, which you can see here, one of which was at Headstone Point. As the sharks swim past the acoustic receivers, a ping is registered, and when you download the data, you can see which sharks swam past which receiver and on what day and time. So after downloading their data, the scientists discovered that the sharks were indeed being more commonly recorded on the western side of the island, with Headstone Point being the highest, recording a total of 1,295 tiger shark detectives. Interestingly, despite the cow dumping process significantly decreasing in recent years, the sharks were still turning up at Headstone, but they weren't being seen commonly in areas where humans were swimming, particularly here in Kingston, which hosts Emily Bay, a swimming hotspot. I say they weren't being commonly seen here, they weren't really being seen here at all, with a total of two detections on that particular receiver. So if you looked at that graph there, you'd probably say it seems fairly clear their behavior has been changed. They're hanging out more commonly in the areas where the cows used to get chucked into the sea. But the scientists kept those acoustic receivers running all year round, and they noticed something really interesting. For a large chunk of the year, the tiger sharks completely disappeared from Norfolk Island. Between the middle of July and the end of October, the sharks weren't picked up by the receivers at all. And you can see that pretty clearly on this graph here. You can see the different acoustic stations on the left, and each blue dot is a tiger shark that's been detected on one of those stations. And you can see very clearly from February to April, there's lots of detections. And from late October to January, there's lots of detections. But here in the middle, July to October, there's pretty much nothing. And that means the sharks decided to head off elsewhere. Based on satellite tracking, it turns out some of them headed thousands of miles away to New Caledonia, 
New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, and the Great Barrier Reef. Now, if the shark behavior had been drastically changed and they were relying heavily on cattle as their primary source of food, you'd expect the sharks to stay at Norfolk Island all year round, but they don't. They head off elsewhere doing something else. As to exactly what that is, we're not entirely sure yet. But Chris, I can hear you screaming at your screens. You haven't told us how the tiger sharks get so big here. Well, it turns out it's not really to do with the cows at all. Loads of people said it had to be the all-you-can-eat cow buffet that led to these sharks attaining these enormous sizes. Lots of free food means more energy to put towards growth. It checks out. But that wasn't what the scientists found from the samples that they took. As part of their research, they were collecting blood and muscle samples from the sharks to perform stable isotope analysis. The samples in the blood would give us answers as to what the sharks had been eating in the last few weeks, whereas the samples in the muscle would tell us what they'd been eating in the last few months. And if the outputs from both of those two samples looked the same, then you could safely say that their diets hadn't changed, at least in the space of a few months. But after the stable isotope analysis results came in, they couldn't believe what they were seeing, so much so that they had to double check their data. It turned out that cows made up just 10% of the tiger shark's diet nowhere near the amount they were expecting. So what was it that the sharks were eating? What was sustaining this population and allowing them to grow to these massive sizes? Seabirds. Tiger sharks consuming seabirds isn't anything new. Scientists have known about this for years, but at Norfolk Island, seabirds consisted of over half of their diet, 52%. The island boasts a nesting and breeding colony of wedge-tailed shearwaters, a medium-sized common seabird for the area. And these shearwaters nest on Norfolk Island in their thousands, with population estimates being somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 breeding pairs. Shearwaters will regularly perform the rafting behavior where they'll sit in large groups on the surface of the ocean at dusk. Hundreds of chunky birds sitting on the surface of the ocean at dusk. That right there is a tiger shark buffet. But get this, the shearwaters don't spend all of the year on Norfolk Island. They're only really there for the austral summer. Specifically, they'll arrive in their hundreds from mid to late October where they'll have their chicks, which then go on to fledge in mid-May, and then they're all gone. Those timings sound suspiciously similar to another set of timings we've already learned about in this video. Yep, that's right. It matches up almost exactly with the tiger shark movements at Norfolk Island. Shearwaters have been documented in the stomachs of tiger sharks at Norfolk, and there was even one report from 2001 that describes a situation where 40 individual shearwaters were pulled out of the stomach of a dead tiger shark at Norfolk Island. 40. That's almost like having 40 American footballs in your stomach. It's bonkers. These massive tiger sharks have been gorging themselves on adult shearwaters and probably the chicks, and that's likely one of the easiest meals they could have to catch and expends the least amount of energy. And that seabird buffet has just allowed them to put all of that energy they're saving into growing. Now, there is some suggestion that the cows could be indirectly benefiting the sharks. For example, the floating cow carcasses could be attracting small fish species, which then attracts seabirds, which then feeds the sharks. It's a decent thought process, but if it was definitely the case, Charlie Hoovenis points out that we'd probably be seeing that happening year round and the sharks wouldn't leave the island, but the opposite of that is happening. So I'd lean towards agreeing with him on this one. As to what else these massive female tiger sharks are doing at Norfolk other than feeding on seabirds remains up for debate. Considering it's only a portion of the year that they're here for, it would suggest that whatever it is, it's a relatively short yearly phenomenon. It's definitely not giving birth because there'd be signs of juveniles there. So because it's not giving birth, some have pointed that they could actually be mating in Norfolk, fattening up on the seabirds for five months and then making the long journey out into the open ocean to give birth somewhere else. To date though, across all the expeditions to Norfolk Island, the scientists haven't managed to find a single pregnant female via their ultrasounds. So there's definitely a lot more work to be done to find out exactly what's going on. That cow carcass dumping though, it's crazy to see these mega tiger sharks chowing down on a cow. It's interesting though because the dumping of cows, offal and waste hasn't really had an impact here in Norfolk compared to other places where that's happened before. It reminds me a little bit of what went down in Recife in Brazil, but in that example it had some pretty disastrous results, which I tell you all about in this video right here. At one point in time, this 12 mile stretch of coastline was considered to be one of the most deadly stretches of coastline in the world, and it had something to do with dumping cows in the ocean, so make sure you give it a watch here. 